Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this program, Electric Vehicles 101 with 4th Mobility. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the Community Relations team at the Deschutes Public Library. Every month we explore a theme in our programming, and this month's theme is flow, like electric flow. Steve Alleman is a project manager at 4th Mobility. 4th is a nonprofit trade association that advances electric, smart, and shared transportation. Fourth accomplishes this goal through four major areas of work, industry, innovation, and development, demonstration projects, advocacy, and engagement. Stephen, thank you for telling us more about electric vehicles and maybe about that rebate. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Laurel, and big shout out to Deschutes Public Library for having me. Um, let me share my screen. Give me just a moment. All right. Um, so Laurel kind of covered uh, some background about Forth. Um, as Laurel mentioned, I'm a program manager for Forth. Uh, we, these are the these are the main four areas that um, we really try to accomplish, um, trying to uh, promote electric vehicles. Uh, so through industry development, uh, policy advocacy, demonstration project pro projects, and consumer engagement. Um, all right, so we're just going to dive straight in, right into the benefits of electric vehicles. Um, just right off the bat, uh, there's a much lower cost of ownership uh, for electric vehicles, mainly when it comes to maintenance. Uh, electric vehicles actually have 75% less moving parts than a internal combustion engine. So less parts equals, you know, less maintenance, less problems. Um, also, the cost of electricity is much, much lower um, than gasoline, and it's also a lot less volatile. And what I mean by that is volatile in price. So, you know, you might drive by a gas station and see that the gas prices have fluctuated quite a bit, you know, within a month or within, you know, within the year. Uh, electricity is typically very, very steady. Um, also, uh, energy dollars are going to stay local. So if you, you know, whatever energy you're using, um, if that's turned into electric electricity, uh, you're going to be supporting more of your um, local economy through that. Um, and finally, it's, it's really, it's a lot better for um, the climate to be using electric vehicles, uh, zero emissions out of the tailpipe. Um, and even if you were to use uh, gasoline to produce electricity, um, you would have three times as much um, electricity as, um, or it would be three times more efficient um, than it would be to uh, just burn the gasoline. Uh, and generally, uh, if you haven't driven an EV, I would highly recommend it because they're a ton of fun to actually get behind the wheel and drive. Um, I've always kind of felt it felt a little bit more connected to um, the vehicle uh, through there's something called regenerative braking. So when, as soon as you take your foot off the accelerator, um, your car is actually going to start recharging the battery and braking you um, steadily. So uh, you can do what's called one uh, pedal driving, which is where you, you can take off your foot from the accelerator and that will slow you down. And once you get used to that, it just kind of feels like there's no going back. Um, and I'll also say that the instant torque, um, acceleration, all of that, that definitely doesn't hurt. Um, due to the weight of the batteries in electric vehicles, um, they actually have a very low center of gravity and it, it makes, uh, handling tight corners, uh, feel a lot easier. Um, they're also extremely quiet. Um, I'm sure that many of you have heard like a hybrid vehicle when it's in all electric mode. So if you hear like a, you know, Prius, um, go by in like a parking lot, you won't really hear much. And most electric vehicles are even quieter than a Prius would be. All right, so just as I mentioned earlier, uh, electricity is a lot cheaper than gasoline um, for the most part. And I say for the most part, because it can vary depending on where you're buying your electricity or where you're buying your gasoline. Um, but this is a pretty cool tool right here. Um, <clears throat> and I can share these present, share the, these slides with Laurel and, and possibly she can share them out with all of you. Um, but if you use that tool, uh, you'll actually be able to go to whatever state you're in and figure out um, how much you, you're paying kind of per gallon um, in gasoline, and then how much that compares if you were to pay um, for electricity. 
And these rates, uh, they calculate them assuming that you're charging at home. So if you were to go to a public, public uh, electric car charging station, um, you might end up paying a little bit more than that price. All right, this is just a grid across the US that explains um, how, uh, how much uh, less you're emitting um, by driving an EV depending on where you live. So the reason why it varies so much is if you were to live in California, uh, your electricity grid is a lot cleaner. Um, so there's more renewable energy there. And so it would be compared to driving a um, internal combustion vehicle that got 122 miles per gallon. Um, and the, in the Pacific North, uh, the, uh, yeah, the Pacific Northwest, um, generally we have a really clean grid. And so it makes a lot of sense to drive electric vehicles here. Um, if you get into some of these other areas where the, the, you know, maybe the energy grid isn't so clean, it still makes a lot of sense to uh, drive electric because you're supporting, um, you know, the, the um, local economy in that area and you're not buying, buying foreign oil. So there are benefits all around, um, but you'll see more of a benefit if you live in the Pacific Northwest or somewhere else with a really clean energy grid. All right, just kind of explaining the different types of vehicles here. So at the uh, top left, you can see a Tesla Model 3. And then on the bottom right, that is a Mitsubishi Outlander uh, plug-in hybrid. Um, so BEV is a battery electric vehicle. It's the, the acronym we use. Um, and they're 100% electric, 100% uh, battery powered, um, and you have to plug them in to recharge. Um, Examples of this are like a Chevy Bolt EV, uh, Volkswagen E-Golf, uh, Kia Soul EV. So there's a Kia Soul with an internal combustion engine and there's also a Kia Soul that is just completely a pure EV. Um, that's pretty typical for a lot of companies. Uh, the Hyundai um, Kona is one that can be electric or a pure EV as well. Um, and obviously all Teslas are uh, BEVs. So a plug-in hybrid or a PHEV uh, uses both electric and uh, gas. So um, the idea there is that you'll use the majority of your uh, in-town driving, you'll be using um, electric. And so you'll just go home and plug into, you know, a 110 outlet or potentially a um, 220 if you want to charge a little faster. Um, and uh, all of those in-town short trips will be electric. And so it'll be a lot cheaper in that regard. Um, but if you needed to go on a long road trip and didn't want to stop and charge, you would still have the option to stop by a gas station and fill up your tank. Um, and you can also, most of these have an electric mode only where you can kind of turn that off and try to really kind of gamify it and see if you can go everywhere in electric. Um, I, I hear a lot of people do that. Uh, also, um, I should note that the uh, one caveat to having both things uh, you know, internal combustion engine and having um, a uh, electric motor is that you potentially could end up with more maintenance. There isn't a lot of maintenance with a uh, electric motor, um, but you still have the regular oil changes and all the other stuff that any internal combustion car, any internal combustion car would have because you're a plug-in hybrid and have both systems. Okay, so this is a little graphic that explains how electric vehicles range it kind of fluctuates. And it really depends on how fast you're driving, how many accessories you're using, what type of terrain you're on, and then the outside temperature. So I'll start off with the outside temperature. Um, I'm sure that many of you own iPhones or have used iPhones at least, and notice that if you get in a really cold area, um, the battery, you know, the phone may not work as well, or it might have like a safety shut off mode. Um, it's obviously not as extreme when it comes to an electric vehicle, because these batteries are a lot more robust. Um, and really, really like secured and, and um, they've got a lot of things to help uh, insulate them. But uh, if you live in a really, really cold area, um, you will notice that your range actually goes down. So if you have, you know, a 200 a range or a car with 200 miles, uh, you might want to kind of expect to only get um, a range of 160 if it's, you know, below freezing outside. Um, when it comes to steep terrain, uh, obviously, if you're charging up a hill, 
Um, regardless of whatever fuel you're going to be using, you're going to be using more of it. And this is very true with electric vehicles. Um, but what's interesting is because you have the regenerative brake, uh, regenerative braking feature, typically when you go up a hill, you can gain most of that range on the way back um, down the hill as long as you're just coasting and um, really driving uh, smartly and using the, the terrain to your advantage. Um, obviously speed is, is a big factor here. Um, I find the sweet spot for most of these electric vehicles is right around 60 to 65 miles per hour. Um, if you go beyond that, you'll kind of notice that you're going through your range much, much quicker. Um, yeah, that, that just kind of makes sense. Um, but also at the same time, if you're driving not super fast, uh, you might end up, uh, using some range as well. Um, the interesting thing about it is if you were to drive like in the city with an, e an electric vehicle, um, it's kind of the opposite of internal combustion engine. You're range is going to be way, way better. So I know folks in Portland that drive a vehicle that's supposed to only have a range of 230 miles and they get about 330 out of those or 330 miles out of it before they have to stop and charge. Um, so really it, it comes down to highway driving is, is the toughest thing for electric vehicles. But if you stay right at that, you know, 55 to 65 range, um, you'll be able to um, get that, uh, the battery to last a lot longer. Um, also, uh, excessive use of the accessories will drain more of the battery. Uh, a big thing for electric vehicles is if you heat your car, um, you'll notice a lot of drain on that battery. Um, one way that electric vehicles actually have kind of worked around this is many electric vehicles come with a heated steering wheel or heated uh, seats. So the idea there is that you heat the driver or the passenger, uh, but not necessarily the air in the vehicle or air in the cabin, because that's a lot less efficient um, than it would be to uh, just heat specifically, you know, where they're sitting and what they're hanging on to. A good example of that is the uh, Nissan Leafs. Um, they all have heated steering wheels and heated seats because their range is not super um, far. Most the standard leaf comes with a range of 150 miles. You can get a leaf plus, which gets, I think, 230. All right, I kind of covered this earlier, but uh, electric vehicles are just a lot cheaper to maintain than um, internal combustion vehicles. And this is mainly due to 75% less moving parts. Um, on average, uh, electric vehicle owners save about $800 per year in maintenance. Um, you have no oil changes and, you know, just other, other parts that don't exist, such as air filters. There are some for the cabin, um, timing belts, uh, you know, spark plugs, all that stuff is gone. Um, and the regenerative braking feature, uh, because it's spinning the motor backward, it actually doesn't, it, it makes it so you don't need to use your brake pads as much. And they typically last about three times as long as in an internal combustion vehicle. All right, so let's talk about some of the rebates that are available for electric vehicles in Oregon. Um, there is a federal tax credit that goes up to 7,500 off the purchase or lease of a new EV. Um, if you, I will say if you lease a uh, EV, the dealership will actually get this uh, tax credit, um, but typically you can negotiate that into your lease price and your monthly payment. Also utilities have um, a lot of rebates or incentives. Um, so make sure to check with your you know, local utility provider and, and see if it makes sense for you to get an electric vehicle. They might have some really enticing rebates. All right. I'm also representing um, the Oregon Clean Vehicle re Rebate. And so these are some slides that uh, I've worked with DEQ to put together. If you have any questions about these, uh, I'm always happy to, to uh, talk about them later and I'll have my email at the end of this presentation. Um, so first off, there is a standard rebate in Oregon that is up to 2,500 off the purchase or lease of a new, um, yeah, new uh, electric or plug-in hybrid vehicle. So the, the plug-in hybrid vehicles only qual qualify for 
a certain amount of that rebate. Um, and it kind of depends on battery size. So I'll get into that a little bit more later on. Um, there's also an, an additional uh, $2,500 uh, rebate called the charge ahead rebate. And this is uh, off the purchase or lease of a new or used electric vehicle um, or plug-in hybrid. So the way you, that's calculated, I'll get into that in a, in a minute as well um, to figure out if you do um, qualify for that. So together, that's $5,000 total in Oregon rebates. Um, awesome. Okay, so here's a little graphic to talk about who um, qualifies and who doesn't. Um, so you have to be, for the standard rebate, you have to be an Oregon resident. Uh, businesses can apply to, nonprofits and government agencies can as well. So if you happen to work for a you know, government agency, um, nonprofit or business that's upgrading their, their fleet, this might be something you, you want to talk to your fleet manager about as well because um, you can get up to $2,500 off of each one of those vehicles. Um, there is a limit to that. If you are buying uh, vehicles for a fleet, you can do this only 10 times a year. Um, but if you're a personal resident, um, I don't know if there is a limit. I don't think there is. Um, so what vehicles qualify? So for the standard rebate, only new um, battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids uh, will qualify, and they have to have a base MSRP of under $50,000. So a, a good example of that is, let's say you want to buy a Tesla Model 3. Um, its base MSRP is, uh, you know, 40000 something. Um, even if you were to buy, you know, have that scaled up to a $60,000 vehicle, because its base MSRP is below $50,000, you'd still qualify for the rebate. An example of one that a vehicle that would not qualify is the Jaguar, Jaguar I-Pace. Uh, its MSRP is over 60,000, so it does not qualify for the standard rebate. Um, all right. So for the charge ahead rebate, uh, it is new or used battery electric vehicles um, as well. So it doesn't have to be just new, but you do need to purchase a used vehicle from the dealership. So it's no no person to person sales uh, qualify there. And also follows the same rule of having that vehicle being under a base MSRP of 50,000. All right, so there's an income requirement for the charge ahead rebate, but not for the standard rebate. So um, regardless of whatever your income is, you should always apply for the standard rebate if you're going for a battery electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid. Um, when it comes to the charge ahead rebate, um, that's calculated by it's, you have to be under 120% of the median, uh, median household income in your metropolitan um, statistical area. So it's a mouthful, it's confusing, um, but if you go to DEQ's website, which I will reference uh, later on in the presentation, they have a, a income calculator that you can type all of your information in and they'll just do the math for you. Um, and so here's the caveat about battery size I was talking about earlier. Um, if it is a motorcycle, it's likely going to have a really small battery. Um, and there's a couple different companies that have uh, pure electric motorcycles, uh, including Harley Davidson. Uh, now they have a, a live wire, which is a really cool um, bike that I saw at the auto show last year. And they also have, or sorry, not talking about Harley anymore. Um, the other requirement is that uh, for battery sizes that are under uh, 10 kilowatt hours, and you can look this up um, whenever you're looking into a vehicle, you can go check to see what the kilowatt hours are and the battery size. Um, or if you don't know, you can always shoot me an email and I can answer those questions for you. Um, but a good example of um, a vehicle that would only qualify for 1500 is a plug-in hybrid Hyundai Ionic, and it actually has a nine kilowatt hour battery. And just because it's under that threshold, you'd only get um, that 1500 um, versus uh, the Mitsubishi Outlander, which I mentioned back here, right here, the Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi Outlander. 
uh, that actually has a 12 kilowatt hour battery. Um, and that pushes it right over the threshold of a 10 kilowatts, uh, a 10 kilowatt hour battery. Um, and so it would, it would qualify for the full um, $2,500 from that rebate. As far as the charge ahead rebate goes, um, whether it's a plug-in hybrid that you're buying that's used or a, a pure electric, it will qualify um, for the full 2,500. All right, so just some more information about the standard rebate. Uh, you have to be an Oregon resident with proof of Oregon residency. Um, you also have to uh, purchase or lease uh, a new battery electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid, um, or zero emission motorcycle. That makes, just makes sense. Um, and you have to report that sale within the first um, six months after, after making it. Um, you also have to register the vehicle in Oregon and retain that registration for at least two years. I already mentioned that you have to submit within six weeks or since six months, sorry about that. All right, and for the charge ahead rebate, uh, you have to qualify for that low to moderate income household uh, with proof of income eligibility. Um, often the dealerships can kind of help you with this, but if, you know, the, really the best place to go to figure out this information is at this website right here. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I can open that up at the end of the presentation and walk you guys through how to do some of that. Um, obviously you have to purchase or lease a new, uh, or a used or new battery electric, uh, plug-in hybrid. So you can use the charge ahead for, uh, a new vehicle as well. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it has to be through a dealership. So there's no person to person sales. Um, even if you knew someone who had a Nissan Leaf that you really wanted to buy, it might make sense for you to, you know, have them sell it to dealership and then you could go buy it. Cause in that way you, you'd be able to access that rebate. Um, you also have to, same thing as the standard rebate. You have to register uh, the vehicle vehicle in Oregon and retain that registration for at least two years. And once again, there's that six month um, period where you have to get that uh, application in, otherwise you will not qualify for the rebate. If you, can, if you wanna calculate uh, whether um, you qualify in your uh, metropolitan statistical area, uh, this is the best way to, best tool to do that. All right. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, here's that limit of, of 10 per calendar year uh, as far as uh, fleet vehicles for nonprofits, businesses, and government agencies. Um, for the, uh, to qualify as a, a government agency or nonprofit, um, you have to be Oregon-based or affiliated. Um, I think Oregon affiliated is kind of a, a loose, um, it's a loose guideline. If, if you work for an agency in California, but do most of your traveling in Oregon, I believe it would still qualify. Um, and once again, the, all of the same things apply here. You have to register and keep that registration in Oregon for at least two years. If you don't do that, um, you'll actually have to re re refund um, DQ for the 2,500. Um, the one thing that's different for nonprofits, businesses, and government agencies is that you will have to um, submit annual usage data to DEQ for the first three years. All right. So how to apply, uh, you can download the paper application um, on that website that I showed you earlier and mail it in. That's currently the best way to do it. Um, and you'll have to send in uh, a copy of proof or of temporary or permanent uh, vehicle registration, a copy, uh, a copy of the sales or lease contract um, and proof of residency. All right, well, if you have any more questions about the rebate specifically, um, feel free to reach out to uh, DEQ directly um, through the OCVRP uh, email here or myself, if you'd like to just get some answers uh, quickly. All right, well, I'm gonna take a step back from uh, rebates and go into a little bit more background about uh, electric vehicle charging. So 
uh, in the industry, we kind of look at uh, charging as three different levels. And uh, this first one is level two, which is just the most basic, uh, you know, your 110 to 120 uh, standard uh, volt outlet. And for the most part, uh, all of these, like you should be able to plug in pretty much anywhere uh, to be able to charge using one of these. Um, and they charge relatively slow. It's about three to five uh, miles per hour that you're uh, of range that your car will get back. Um, but this is really the best way for folks with plug-in hybrids um, or folks that really just don't use their car that much. Um, I know a couple people with uh, you know pure electric cars that have ranges of 250, but they still just charge um, this way because they really don't use their car enough to justify having a bigger charger installed in their house. All right, so this is level two charging. So this is, uses a um, 220 or 240 volt outlet. Um, you know, it can be your regular dryer plug. Uh, if you have one of those in your garage, fantastic. Um, because you could be really pretty much set for a, an EV if, if you're not using it right now. Um, Typically, these are the chargers that you'll see around town. Um, there's a lot of public chargers that are level two charging chargers. Uh, you know, specifically, if you were to stop and get like a cup of coffee, the idea is to just plug in for a little while and then you come back out, you get some extra extra range. Um, but these are also really great chargers to have installed either in workplaces or at your own home. Um, I encourage folks that do you know daily commutes to get a level two charger because then you're always gonna be back at 100% um, whenever you plug your car in. All right, so this is level three or what's called DC fast charging. Um, this is something you use, you know, typically on the go. Um, you know, no one has one of these uh, installed at their house or anything. A couple dealerships will have a, a DC fast charger just so they can get a, um, a vehicle up and running quicker if they, it wasn't charged. Um, but uh, these charge really, really fast, um, much, much faster than the level two or level one. Um, most chargers can get you up to 80% of your vehicles charge uh, in 20 to 40 minutes. Uh, typically I find if I plug into one of these and I'm really low on my, um, my range, I can go grab a bite to eat and I can come back and my car will be good to go. Um, what's interesting about DC fast charging is because there, it's so much energy at once and so fast, um, it's actually better to keep your vehicle, if you plan to DC fast charge um, a lot, it's better to keep your vehicle between the ranges of 20% to 80%. Um, an analogy I like to use is uh, it's kind of like filling up a glass of water where if, if the glass is empty, you're going to pour a lot faster at the beginning. But once it gets close to the top, just to be careful, you're going to start slowing down. Um, so once you get past 80%, the battery is going to be doing th that same thing. It wants to get more charged up, but there's just less room. Um, to essentially shuffle everything around. And so it slows it down essentially as a safety measure. Um, so the, the most efficient way for you to charge at a DC fast charging station is to just go um, up to that 80% and then take off. And if you need to charge again, just plug in and charge up to 80% again at your next stop. There's also three different types of chargers that you'll find um, for public charging. Uh, if you, I'll go back here for a second. If you actually are at a level two, um, there's a standard port for all level two chargers. The only cars that have anything different is, is Tesla. Um, that's because they have all of their chargers are pr pr proprietary and um, whether you're fast charging or doing a standard charge, it's the same plug. When it comes to DC fast charging, um, you have what's called CCS. Uh, which is kind of the American European standard. And that takes the uh, level two charger in like plug right here. So all, all vehicles typically have this for electric vehicles except for Tesla, and then just adds two prongs below it. Um, and so 
something to note about that is that not all electric vehicles will come uh, with the capability to do this. Uh, some electric vehicles will only come with the capability to uh, level one or level two charge. And if you plan on going on road trips or needing to charge quickly, um, I highly recommend making sure that you get the package that can do um, DC fast charging. An example uh, of a vehicle that sometimes doesn't come with DC fast charging is actually the uh, Chevy Bolt. Um, I've known a couple of people that bought it and didn't realize that they didn't end up um, with fast charging. They were pretty bummed. Um, this is called Chatamo. Chatamo is the, the Japanese standard uh, for fast charging. And you'll typically find these in um, these ports in Nissan Leafs or uh, a couple of the Kia Souls. Um, the early ones actually had a, a Chatamo um, charging station or charging port. But we kind of expect these to get phased out over time. Um, but for the most part, if you go to a DC fast charging station, both options will be available. Um, and the reason why um, you don't have a Tesla available or Tesla charger available there is because Tesla has a lot of their own um, supercharging network that you can go to. Um, and if you're driving a Tesla, you can actually tell the vehicle to go find you um, a charger and it'll map it out for you. It's a really neat feature. Um, but then one bonus thing about uh, Tesla's is they also have an adapter for Chatmo. So if you were at, uh, this is in Portland, Oregon, at uh, downtown, it's called Electric Ave. Um, so if you're at Electric Avenue and you had a Tesla, um, even though you don't have that uh, connection or the car doesn't come with it, you would be able to have a, you could purchase an adapter and I think it's like $400 um, to have the, the option to plug into a Chatmo port as well. All right, so this is just, uh, these are some of the apps you can use to actually find where public charging stations are. Um, you know, the reality of, of public charging is that right now it's just not quite as uh, abundant as gas stations are. Um, but I really expect, and I think most people in the industry expect that to change quickly um, and expect it to kind of, you know, you're, you're gonna be able to plug in pretty much anywhere you're at. Um, in the near future, uh, depending on how much you know your local area has invested in infrastructure. Um, this is downtown Portland. There's obviously obviously a good amount of chargers here. Um, you can tell what is fast charging and what is uh, level two charging based on the colors. So um, we're using PlugShare, by the way. There's a couple different apps that do this. Um, the orange represents a fast charging network. So if you wanted to go um, if, you, if you're planning to go on a road trip and you're low on, on charge, those were the areas you'd want to go. Um, and these green level two chargers, um, they're often just at businesses that want to kind of attract EV drivers um, or, uh, and those, those are typically free stations um, or they're paid uh, for you to essentially have um, you pay a, sm a small fee per kilowatt hour that is charged well plugged into them. Um, they're often at grocery stores or things like that. So you can kind of just keep plugging your car in while you're doing your errands. Um, all right. Oh, and one more thing on PlugShare, you can actually tell, um, if a, um, charging station is out of order, because it'll show this little wrench icon, um, and you can click on it and see, uh, so this, I'm not actually in the app, but. Uh, you'd be able to click on these and actually see the last time they're serviced and if anyone was actually plugged in at the current moment. Um, and that can be really handy on a road trip because if you know that someone's using using a specific charging station, you know, you may want to plan to just skip that charger and go to the next one so you don't have to wait for them to finish up. All right, so this is specifically covering um, the supercharging network. Um, so supercharging refers to uh, Tesla's um, fast chargers, which um, are actually uh, a little faster than the um, than all of the rest of the charging networks um, that are that exist. So all of these dots on in um, on the map here 
represent uh, fast charging stations. And the idea to have them spread all across like that is so if you own a Tesla, you can travel anywhere. Um, obviously there's a couple areas where there isn't fast charging, but um, typically in those areas, Tesla tries to have destination chargers. Um, so that means like some hotel will have a lot of level two chargers. So if you were to not be able to make it to one of these stations, um, you could potentially spend the night over or stay in a hotel overnight and have your car charge um, using the slower option. Now, Electrify America is a uh, another charging network that is pretty robust um, for the most part. Um, they're really invested in the Pacific Northwest, um, but you can see that um, you can travel in most areas uh, throughout um, the US uh, using this network. Um, but there are some areas and some states altogether that don't have Electrify America chargers. That doesn't mean that there isn't any EV charging there. Uh, it just might mean that there isn't uh, fast charging there um, or at least not Electrify America fast chargers. So likely you'd be able to find a level two charger or uh, at very least you could always plug into a standard 110 outlet. This is another app that I like a lot. It's actually called Chargeway. Um, the nice thing about Chargeway is they've switched up the way you, you see things. Um, and so a fast charger here will appear in blue. Um, actually, no, sorry. The fast, the number refers to how quickly it charges. Um, so anything above two is gonna be a fast charger. Um, and in a couple of areas, you'll actually see the number seven or eight. Um, that means that that charger is, is capable of, of charging faster than most vehicles can actually take. Um, an example of a vehicle that charges really fast is the, uh, the newest Porsche, the electric Porsche can charge in 20 minutes or less. Um, but you would have to use one of those stations that is high powered to be able to do that. Um, otherwise it's just going to charge as fast as that station will allow. The, uh, the blue actually represents uh, Chatamo. So if you were driving a Nissan Leaf and you saw that there was some blue stations, um, that's where you want to go. Um, you could use the green stations, um, but uh, those are slow chargers. So um, yeah. And another nice thing about Chargeway is, uh, or two nice things is you actually select the vehicle you're driving and it eliminates any charging station that your vehicle cannot use. Um, the second feature I really like is there's a trip planner. Um, so you could say where you want to go, how much range is in your battery right now. Um, and it'll map it out for you and actually tell you where you're going to stop and charge. And that's really helpful information because you can plan out your trip a little bit more, you know, figure out if you want to grab, uh, you know, maybe a dinner here when you get here. Um, and it just makes the, the trip a little bit more enjoyable and, and um, you just, just can plan it out a bit more ahead of time, which is great. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the future EVs that are coming and also automaker uh, commitments. Um, there's a lot more that I actually don't have on this slide, but I'm sure you have all heard uh, you know, different standards like uh, California is looking to only have electric vehicles sold in, in their state by 2035. Um, and the major players and the OEMs, original manufacturers are really taking note of these changes and these shifts. Um, so companies like Daimler or Daimler um, have invested just tons, like 22, I think it's actually more than 22.5 billion now. Um, I know that they have a lot invested in um, electric semi-trucks. Um, GM has, they're expected to have 23 all electric models by, um, 2023. Uh, they, they actually had a Super Bowl commercial for, um, their newest SUV, which is a, a pretty exciting, uh, car. It's going to be, be able to charge, um, really fast as well. Ford is expected to have 40 EVs by 2022. I'm not sure if they'll make it, but, uh, they are releasing the, uh, Ford F-150 that will all, they'll be all electric. So that's pretty exciting. Um, Hyundai already has quite a few. They have, uh, a plug-in hybrid, um, version and a pure electric version of the, uh, Hyundai Ionic. 
Um, and you can also get a, um, uh, a uh, Kona in Pure Electric. Uh, they also, Hyundai also owns Kia, or that at least they have the same parent company. And um, Kia has the Kia Nero plug-in hybrid, or you can also get that as a Pure Electric as well. I won't go into the rest of them, but uh, pretty much lots of commitments from the uh, car manufacturers. And um, it's really good to see that as a, as a big shift um, and what's coming soon. So I just want to highlight some of the vehicles that are going to be out in the near future that look kind of exciting. I'm sure you've all heard of the uh, Tesla Cybertruck. Uh, it gets a lot of buzz and media attention. Um, it likely won't look like this. Uh, this one doesn't even have rear view mirrors, um, but they haven't really released what the final uh, Cybertruck is going to look like, which is pretty crazy because people have already pre-reserved a lot of that vehicle. Um, there's also going to be, uh, well, there is a company called Rivian. Um, they have an SUV version of this uh, vehicle and also uh, this truck, which is a really cool car that um, I'm, I'm excited for personally. Uh, if you are interested, I definitely would recommend watching kind of the YouTube tutorials about this vehicle. It's, it's an awesome one. Um, Hummer, there's a Hummer EV coming. Uh, it's going to be... Well, that might be right. I think the MSRP might be a little bit off here because this was a, I made this slide last year, um, at the end of last year. Um, but this vehicle is expected to have uh, 250 miles to up to, I think, 500 miles is actually the, the range that they recently said it could have. Um, and about, I think, a thousand pounds of torque. Um, so it's a pretty crazy vehicle. Uh, it's going to be able to tow a lot, which is exciting. And as I mentioned earlier, the uh, Ford F-150 um, is coming out as an all-electric vehicle. So that I'm really excited about as someone that, uh, you know, grew up driving a Ford F-150. I think that um, having the capability to have trucks that are pure electric will be an absolute game changer. Um, Ford is also has released um, the Mustang Mach E. Uh, it's a pretty cool, you know, mid-sized uh, SUV, um, and you can get a higher range package with it. It actually depends. Um, you can the lowest range you can get is 230, and I believe you can get actually more than 300 miles of range. Um, but I, I forget what the the price ends up being for that. My personal favorite is the uh, Volkswagen ID Buzz. Um, I think the picture just kind of is, it, it, the picture is worth a thousand words. It just looks awesome. Um, I don't know if I'd be going to the beach, but I'd really like to take one of these up to the mountain to snowboard. All right, if you have any questions, I'm sure that there's some in the attendee chat, so I'll get to that shortly. Um, but I wanted to plug one more thing before I stop talking. Um, if you're in Deschutes County and, and you really just want to find out more about electric vehicles or figure out where you can test drive one, um, this is the Environmental Center. Uh, they specialize in alternative fuels and um, really have, they, they do an amazing job of um, covering electric vehicles. And um, yeah, I, I'd recommend reaching out and uh, I can get you in connection with them as well. I, I highly recommend working with uh, Neil Bonsgard. All right, so that's the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Stephen. So let's see if there's any questions out there. Um, are any of the trucks that you mentioned coming out four by four? Yeah, um, the Rivian, uh, Let's see what what's it called the r1t um that will be a four by four uh it'll have that option um so yeah that's that's one of them um they aren't available yet they're supposed to come out this year but i don't know if they'll be available um until i think q4 um of this year maybe even 2022 uh, they really got a, a big back order because Amazon bought up a lot of the original cars as um, their delivery trucks. Okay, surprising. Does mm -hmm. anyone else have any questions? 
I guess I'll ask Gwen while we're waiting for Annie to come out. Um, you know, you mentioned driving in the snow, and I, I, I tend to think of electric vehicles as being less robust and good at being in the snow, like being four by four. Or is that something that's being improved on? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, there's some electric vehicles that are out there that from the get go, they kind of thought about this and were really prepared for snow. Um, I would say Tesla's are actually a lot more capable than, than most people would expect because, uh, regardless of what Tesla you get, you can get one with all wheel drive or for, or not, not all wheel drive, four wheel drive. Um, so that can be really helpful. Um, but a big thing is it actually comes down to the tires you have on your EV as well. Um, some of these electric vehicles, like I'll use the Chevy Bolt as an example, um, they their wheelbase doesn't allow for you to put chains on them. Um, so you have to use kind of snow socks or uh, studded tires. Um, and that can make it, you know, they're fairly safe um but it's not the you know it's not the perfect mountain vehicle in that regard um yeah, and then a a nissan leaf another really... <laughs> yeah exactly i i wouldn't really recommend it to like go straight um straight up to mount bachelor um but mainly the 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 issue with electric vehicles is a lot of the original ones had high efficiency tires um, and so they don't necessarily grip snow as well as, um, normal tires do. So, uh, you could obviously swap them out. Um, but the reason why they have high efficiency tires, they're a lot, uh, tougher is because with so much torque in the vehicle, you actually can burn your tires out, um, by accident. If you're just trying to accelerate from like a stop sign or something. Um, all right, I see two questions here. Uh, what, okay, what EV, in my opinion, has the best value? Um, it's a tough question. Um, you know, I think if, if we're going non-Tesla, which I'll start off with, because I really think they're two different worlds, um, I would say that the Hyundai Kona um, currently has the best value. I really, really like the Hyundai Kona um, because it has uh a lot of range it's i think it's close to 250 miles which is is plenty for what i do um they come with a lot of really cool features um and altogether they're under 40k so uh they're one of the best that's out there currently um i would say that the mach e is a close competitor with that um but getting to the best value is a little bit trickier because teslas are more expensive um, but where the value in my mind comes in here is the, uh, capability to have all wheel or four wheel drive. Um, and then also if you have a Tesla, you can use the Tesla charging network and you can also access the, all of the other charging networks as well. So it essentially doubles all the places you can charge if you have that vehicle and the adapters. Um, does Subaru have EVs coming? I love it. This is the, uh, the it's most a very question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Oregon question in general. Um, technically, the uh, the Subaru Crosstrek has a, a plug-in hybrid uh, version you can buy, um, and you know I'm supposed to be brand neutral here, but I'm just going to issue a small warning um, to folks. Uh, this car is kind of what I would call a compliance car. Um, they had to make some plug-in hybrids, um, some plug-based cars. So they created this. Um, and I, I really sincerely hope it'll be better in the future. Uh, but essentially the plug-in hybrid cross track right now, um, has a 500 pound battery that isn't designed to fit into the cross track anywhere else. And so it just ends up taking up 25% of your trunk space. Um, so that's kind of a bummer. Um, and even though the battery weighs as much as it does, it's not in a very efficient battery. Um, so you end up only getting about 20 miles of range. Um, so, you know, if you're someone that loves Subaru for their safety, um, and really wants a plug-in hybrid to just drive, you know, 10 miles and back, um, then it, it makes sense to have, but if you plan on, you know, using this as a road trip vehicle, uh, it's probably not the best purchase because 
you'll end up actually you're you'll end up using more gasoline when you're on a road trip because you have that extra weight. So as much as I want Subaru to have a great EV, they currently, they're still working out the kinks. Um, so just being honest with everyone, you may want to, may want to wait and just pay attention there. Um, oh, that's funny. Any EVs that you re <laughs> would you recommend to stay away from? Uh, yeah. I mean, potentially that the uh, Subaru plug-in hybrid, if, uh, that's not, you know, if that's not what you're looking for, um, you know, Subarus have a lot of good things to them as far as safety though. So I understand if you're really loyal to the brand and you want to, um, make sure you're supporting electric and uh, plug-based vehicles. Um, other than that, uh, there aren't really a ton to watch out for, uh, when you buy a Nissan Leaf, um, if you buy it used, there's actually a couple of ways you can figure out if you're um, basically avoid buying a lemon. Um, there is this, uh, I forget what they're called, but the, the little adapter that plugs in underneath the steering wheel, um, there's one of those plugs you can buy and it hooks up to an app in your phone um, called uh, Leaf Spy. And uh, you can use that to figure out how many times uh, that vehicle has been charged, how it's been charged, and how the battery health is. Um, so what I mean by that is if you didn't want to go to a dealership and have them check on that, you could plug this in, download the file on your phone. Um, and essentially it would tell you that, Hey, this battery is only 70% uh, viable. So 30% degraded. Um, and that would give you the idea of, you know, maybe you don't want to purchase that leaf. Maybe you want to find one where you have, you know, 80% or more of the battery is still, uh, functioning fully. I think that kind of connects to this next question. How many years will the batteries last before they don't hold a charge for very long? Yeah, great question. Um, it depends. Uh, so I mentioned Nissan Leafs because they're known for degrading the most. Um, and even that isn't a lot. It's typically only, they only degrade about, you know, 20 to 30% of the battery within 10 years. Um, and the reason why those degrade more than other, uh, electric vehicles is because they are actually air cooled. Um, cause it's a cheaper way to produce a battery is to have essentially air rush around it to cool it off. Um, but pretty much every electric vehicle on the market besides Nissan Leafs is liquid cooled. Um, the challenge there is liquid cooled batteries haven't been around long enough for us to really give an answer on how long they will last. Um, but they seem to be lasting a lot, lot longer, um, with much less degradation. Um, the number I typically tell people is about eight years, um, of a vehicle, you know, of a battery functioning without any degradation or at least minimal. Um, but the reason I use eight years confidently is because almost all of the, uh, manufacturers have an eight year warranty on the battery. So even if something were to go wrong, um, which we have had actually at fourth, cause we have a fleet of EVs ourselves. Um, you could bring it to the dealership and have a, uh, a full battery replacement for free. Um, so that's very typical. Um, and a lot of the truck companies that use the same battery technology are expecting their batteries to last at least 12 years at a minimum. Awesome. Well, I don't see, any more questions but i do wonder stephen there was uh b before we get to that one question there was uh, that slide that had the contact information how do you contact you how to contact organ rebate and i just want to make sure that we end on that slide um but someone asked how <clears throat> excuse me how are these batteries recycled yeah that's that's a really great question um there's actually uh, a couple different ways, uh, depending on the style of battery, um, you know, they can only be used for certain things. So, um, when it comes to Nissan Leaf batteries specifically, because of the, that air cooled system, they're typically used, uh, like a bunch of batteries are piled up and used for either off grid solar systems as like a storage. Um, or, uh, I think my favorite use case I've ever seen is in the UK, um, there's actually a ferry that is completely run off of, uh, recycled Nissan Leaf batteries. Um, 
So that's, that's a big part of it. Uh, and what's interesting is we're kind of seeing the satellite industry pop up of all of these uh, companies or you know, even sometimes government agencies that are getting involved in the battery recycling process and figuring out better and better ways to refine, uh, refine the batteries. Um, some companies uh, try to make sure that their batteries are more modular. And what I mean by that is that you could essentially take out some of the cells that were faulty and then replace them with cells that were working well. Um, and so that's something I expect to see in the future where um, a lot more batteries are being kept on the road because they're not getting that full replacement. Um, and then also once batteries are modular, that will make them easier to take out, um, you know, get rid of faulty ones and essentially uh, use the, the good ones for new projects or even potentially new cars in the future. Hmm. Well, very cool. And our last question here is, is there any talk about car roof solar power charging? There is a lot of talk about that. Um, yeah, I've actually, I've, I've had a, a couple of volunteers I've worked with uh, in the past that have had something like this. Uh, the biggest challenge is um, you don't get a lot currently from a solar panel uh, compared to how much electricity a electric vehicle uses. Um, the famous example of this I, I knew of uh, is this guy had a Airstream trailer hooked up to his Model 3 Tesla um, and that Airstream trailer was decked out with um, solar panels. But I asked him about it because I was you know, was geeking out about it. And he said that in order for him to get a full charge, he would have to leave that in a perfectly sunny area for at least two weeks without moving it. So, you know, it doesn't make a ton of sense to have, um, you know, solar panels on your car, uh, unless your car has either a small battery and it's a plug-in hybrid, um, or uh, you wait until solar panels just become a lot more efficient. Did you want to answer that one about the camper style rigs, uh, sprinters or Winnebago's popping up? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I don't have, and I apologize for this. I, I recently just read an article about sprinter vans, uh, becoming, uh, electric. Um, the challenge I think is that they currently aren't going to have a, a ton of range. Um, I think it's expected to have like 250 miles of range. Um, I could be, I could be wrong about that. Um, once again, I'm kind of just going off of what I've read recently. Um, so, you know, I, I think most people I know of sprinter vans are kind of the folks that use it for road trips. Um, and I think, you know, the, the biggest challenge there is, uh, you're, you're constrained by range and then you're also constrained by the current charging infrastructure. Right. Well, yeah, and there's just a lot of plugging in and charging when you're on the road trip anyway. So that would mm -hmm. be a tall order. Well, if you want to go ahead and share that contact page and... Okay. This is this is not it, but this is the DQ uh, oh. website. Okay. Um, is very and handy. I have it, I'll put it in the chat here. Here, it's like the rebate program page is in the chat right now. But while Stephen is finding that, I just want to thank you in the audience for joining us tonight. And the Deschutes Public Library has a lot of wonderful programs that are all fun, free, and virtual. This program was recorded, and a link will be sent out to all registrants. And you can find upcoming programs, recordings of programs, and the monthly event guide on the event calendar or on our YouTube channel, which is pretty robust by now. And that's great. Perfect. So Steve's, Steven's information is right there. He very kindly offered to have people query him about uh, any follow-up questions or about the rebate. So I appreciate that, Stephen. And I had a lot of good feedback on the program tonight. So thank you for joining us and sharing a lot of great information. Of course. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Have a wonderful night, everyone. I'll leave this up for just a second in case someone wants to write it down, but enjoy your evening. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>